So uh, the, um, the topic today, we're talking about Protestantism and Catholicism. Mark gave a really good overview last, um, two or three weeks ago, at Valley Brewery about uh, the differences more from an analytical perspective. And today I want to give a little bit of the historical background behind all of this, which ties in, of course, to our parish uh, story here. Um, going back before Martin Luther, so we're talking about the... Um, the 1300s, okay, a couple hundred years before Martin Luther, um, there was a, uh, a movement that sort of began a lot of this um, that really took off traction, well, maybe before that, but nominalism was the name of it. Nominalism was a movement in the academic world that, um, if I can summarize it, which if any philosopher were ever to hear me say this, they would probably have my head, but it basically, if you would summarize it, it simply is to categorize things or to call things by a certain name or, um, yeah, name, sort of category, but that the essence of that name can change over time. So in other words, uh, we'll say this pink cup here, uh, we can call it a pink cup, and pink cup is its name, but over time, the, the color of it might shade differently more into a red or something, and you say, well, that's not really pink, it's more orange, it's more whatever, but the essence of it is still pink cut because it was always been that way. And so this, this was a kind of a subcategory in the whole movement of scholasticism, um, and I'm not giving it justice, so please don't take my gloss as gospel truth here, um, but it, it is a very interesting uh, movement that happens in the um, middle, middle ages, late middle ages, which leads up to um, Martin Luther's background. He was trained in nominalism, and he had a scrupulous conscience. Everybody knows what I mean when I use the word scrupulous. Anybody not know what that word means? Okay, good. We're all we're all turned here. You don't know what it means? Well, that's okay. I don't know. Good. That's what I was hoping. Be brave. Say I don't know. These are these are big words I know, uh, and they're not used in everyday speech. Scrupulous is basically a fancy term for saying that they worry too much about everything. They overanalyze things, and that they think that they are guilty when they're not, and that kind of thing. They have an overactive conscience is the way we kind of phrase it. Today. Um, and every single one of us in this room, I guarantee you, is either more on the scrupulous side or more on the carefree side. The the more the um, what's the uh, the sin, the vice that I'm looking for. Uh, anyway, either we care too much or we care too little about um, our faith. And it can go, and it's particularly regarding our moral actions. Um, so we can either uh, overanalyze things too much and think that we're never good enough and can beat ourselves up too much, or we can go on the opposite end and not think too much about our actions and our consequences of our actions, and we can live rather bad lives. And so the goal is to find that middle ground and weave our way through life being on a healthy medium. Uh, Martin Luther did not, and he went off on the other side. Cu that coupling with this nominalism that I explained with you, he began to realize that he could never be good enough to go to heaven. He could never truly be holy enough to be saved. And this created a big, big problem for Martin Luther. So um, Luther, instead of trying to find that balance between overanalyzing things, began to go down the nominalistic route and try to redefine key elements of our faith. For instance, words like faith and the scriptures, um, uh, uh, good works, and these kind of key terms that we understand in the process of our salvation, Luther reinterpreted them. Um, and he came up with the doctrine of faith alone. Um, and he did that by a previous doctrine, and if you were there for Mark's talk, who was there for Mark's talk, by the way? Oh, good, only a few of you. Has anybody watched it online? It's also online, by the way. Uh, all right. Um, sorry? Oh, no, it's on the Theology on Tap website. So, yeah, you just go to the past events link and you can find it. It's a really, really excellent talk. But one of Mark's foundational leading up points that he made in his presentation was that with all of the different strains of the other denomination of Christians that are out there that came out of the Protestant Reformation, they all have one thing in common, and that's that they are themselves the sole authority of interpretation for the Bible. And that means different things for different one of these different groups. And it all comes from Martin Luther, where Martin Luther talked about how the scriptures alone were the authority of our interpretation or our belief, our faith and morals and so forth. Um, and so with that, 
he ultimately came up with the um, understanding of faith alone, that we are saved by our faith alone and not by our works. Um, and he did this by a nominalistic interpretation, really, of St. Paul, where St. Paul talks about how we are saved by grace through faith, etc. Well, Paul is not talking about, in this case, works having no value or no merits for our salvation. He's talking about works of the law, the Old Testament law from Moses, not being applicable anymore to Christians after Christ came. Martin Luther reinterprets that slightly and says, yes, not only is Paul saying that, but it also applies in our day and age to any moral action that we do. So any good action that we do of ourselves cannot ever please God, because God is all holy and we are not. And so Martin Luther shifts the um, understanding just ever so slightly, which seems very much like what we are saying, but has a whole different set of ramifications, many of which Mark talked about in his presentation. And this is where we're going to get into today, where we have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, and discussion time today. So I'm not going to hog up all the time by talking about it. But needless to say, is this thing's not working right. Uh, <laughs> needless, to, needless to say, that uh, what happens is that Martin Luther ultimately gets excommunicated after having many chances to come back to the church um, and to uh, try to reform the church from within, because a lot of Martin Luther's reforms are good. Um, it's easy to demonize him, or it's easy to love him and praise him. Actually, Martin Luther was, like many of us, very much in the middle. A lot of strengths, a lot of weaknesses. Um, and Martin Luther's points about reforming the church, many of which were great, and they were addressed um, at different parts of the church's life after Martin Luther, um, and many of which were not. One of which was the whole notion of sola scriptura, or the, uh, final authority of, um, by the uh, scriptures alone, without the um, authoritative guide of tradition. When I use tradition, I mean capital T tradition in this case. Um, tradition is not just simply the Bible, but it's also the correct understanding of the Bible, and it's also over the period of 2,000 years, from not only Jesus Christ, but also to the present day. And it also encompasses all geographic locations of people. It's not just one regional group of Christians and another one, and they kind of argue with themselves and so forth. It's what was always believed by everybody uh, throughout all time. Um, when you remove that structure, what we call in the Catholic Church is the magisterium. When you remove that magisterium, what you end up having is a free-for-all in terms of belief. In fact, Martin Luther admitted this. He said that everyone is his own pope. And so what ends up happening is Martin Luther ends up starting what he calls the Evangelical Catholic Church, um, which is known today as the Lutheran Church. And from there, that's just Germany. There were similar reformations. There was one in um, England. There was one in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and then there was little ones that scattered around split off of that. So now, in this country alone, we have something like 50,000 different denominations, and around the world, there's countless numbers, and that's not including like the independent churches, like you think of like Saddleback or Mariner's Church, or some of those that are just sort of independent things on a bunch of themselves. Um, those are even an innumerable um, count as well. And they all believe slightly different things um, from each other. And then some of these, like Mariner's or Saddleback or something, are so similar that you can hardly find any differences between but because they were founded in different parts and split off in different groups in the past, they're not united with each other either. Um, and so this whole notion that we as Catholics believe about the importance of being in communion with each other um, and about the authority and the structure of the church representing the body of Christ in an organic way rather than just sort of an intellectual way um, is completely lost among most Protestants. Um, Mark, is there anything else I should address before I pass it over to you a little bit? Uh, no. Okay. All right. So Mark is going to begin and tell us a little bit more about his talk, and then we're going to open it up for discussion time. Um, this is what I presented. And it, it, with the idea here down the, uh, down the y-axis is we have a whole bunch of different beliefs. We have things like evolution, abortion, contraception, the real presence, homosexual marriage, marriage uh, even the number of books in the Bible, uh, belief in the Trinity, belief in rapture, that's kind of a new Protestant thing we've heard a lot about, purgatory, or being women. These are just some hot button issues that are happening today. There's many of these, right? I can go on and on, there are dozens and dozens of, of theological things that people are exploring. And across the top, across the x axis here, is I had, I picked out uh, two, four, six, eight different denominations of Christianity. Yeah, the interesting thing that comes out of this 
is that we have, it's not a Catholic versus Protestant thing. It's a, there's some Protestants that are in violent disagreement with other Protestants about some very, very fundamental issues. So to me, as an engineer in logic, it's like, okay, okay, we got people that are saying things that are absolutely contrary, and we're all Christians. There's got to be something in this, right? God is absolute truth. There has to be something in this that is right. There has to be something that is correct. And that's where the presentation went. But, but to talk about this chart a little bit more, a couple of points. I brought up a number of them um, in, in the talk. But, but I want to focus a little bit on the blanks for a second. So, okay, Mark, what are you, too lazy? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I was a little bit lazy. You get kind of tired of trying to figure out what belongs in these blocks. But there's some other points about the blanks that are kind of interesting. Some of these uh, may be blank. In other words, I couldn't identify the belief in these various things because maybe the issue is too controversial. Maybe it's something that church doesn't really want to talk about because it could lead to another division. That's possible. Maybe it's not considered important. But some of these issues, like holy mackerel, these are pretty darn important issues in life. But maybe that church doesn't consider it important. That's, that's a possibility. Um, some have told me this. I've talked to some ex-Protestant people and, and friends. They've told me uh, that if it's not explicitly listed in the Bible, the church won't comment on it. Not, I'm not saying it's true for all of these, but some churches are that, of that idea. That if I don't see something like abortion is not in there specifically, it doesn't call out that issue, it doesn't say abortion is wrong, therefore, I'll leave it up to you and your interpretation. Oh, the, another one, another comment I get on this table, this, this is pretty interesting, is that... I have friends who say, hey, Mark, look, I'm above all this. I'm above all this. I am non-denominational. I say, okay, okay, that's an interesting point. So what I have to do now is I have to put another column in here, and I'm going to put non-denominational on it. And you've got to tell me answers to these various questions. Because you have beliefs, you have, you have a reason why you believe these various things. Just tell me what they are. So a couple things come out of that. Um, Number one, it's kind of interesting that the way I look at this is you could use the label of non-denominational for your denomination. <laughs> okay, okay. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. And another one that Father Bartis hit on is um, when we do this, somebody is deciding this. Somebody is deciding these, these answers. And the way, I, I like the way he's putting this, is in effect, who is deciding that is the Pope, Right? So in Catholicism, we have, we have, at this time, Francis, right? But all the popes before him helped us fill out this column. Somebody had to decide what goes into these, and you could define that person who decided what goes into these as the pope. So if I am non-denominational, some people say, hey, I'm spiritual. It's, it's an interesting thing. So in effect, in that case, you are your own pope, right? Because you're deciding what goes into each of these boxes. Um, but there's, there's a lot of interesting things. Let me just tell you some of the questions, or a particular question that came to me after the talk, which I thought was, uh, was pretty cool. Um, so somebody said to me, uh, if, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, if the sacraments are so powerful, why do I see so many Catholics who have received them doing so many messed up things? Great question, right? So I got somebody who's baptized, I got somebody who's confirmed, and they're doing some stuff that's really not Christian, right? What's up with that? These, these sacraments are so powerful. What about Guinness? Great question. So, so the response for this, I've heard this actually from my teens too, so it was, it was uh, something that I'm familiar with. But imagine it's my birthday, okay? Imagine it's my birthday, and you want to give me an incredible present. So being a geeky guy, an engineer, you say, Mark, I'm going to give you a computer. It's like, oh, great, thanks, right? So then later you see that... Um, I'm screwing up my taxes, and I'm not answering email, and I'm not up on the news, and you're thinking, what's up with this guy? I gave him a computer, he should, he should be able to do this. What's wrong, okay? So the key is, you could give me that gift, you could give me the computer, am I using it? Am I using it? Did I even open the box? So the story here is, is that we have these incredible gifts. We have these amazing gifts that were given through the sacraments. But it's our choice to use them. The, 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 the cool thing about this is, is God loves us so much that he really wants us to love him truly back. And true love can only come through a conscious choice, through free will. I have to have free will in order to have love. 
So God loves us so much. He, oh man, I hope you love me. I really, really hope you do. But I can't force you. Because if I force you, it's not love. So I'm going to give you these gifts. Man, I hope you use them. But it's your choice. It is your choice. So anyway, I, I hope that makes sense on one of the questions. I thought it was, it was an excellent question. But um, I would like to open it up and let you guys ask questions. And I, and I would like to... Um, a couple caveats. Number one, if it's a, I get, to, I get a choice to say, I don't know. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> and I'm also allowed to say, that's a hard question. Father Bardos has to answer. Okay? I have a question. Um, I noticed that a lot of the young, younger generation of Protestants and even street preachers uh, have now gone on the whole, I love Jesus, but I hate religion bandwagon. Uh, what's, the, what's the kind of response to the whole charge that you still love Jesus, does not be part of religion? Yeah, I've heard that. There's, there's a lot of ways you can approach that. But, but one of the things that I love about organized religion is we're, we're asked to be in community with each other, right? It's kind of they go out, we're supposed to be, be loving one another. And it's not just a relationship with me and God. That's, that's a lot of people say it's, it's just me and God. If you look at some of this, the solas, this, the, uh, the Protestant solas, they take out the idea of me praying to saints. And, the, and again, I don't want to sound accusational. I don't want to be coming across that way. That's, no. It's not my point. I, I, I don't want to do that. It's just I'm trying to point out some differences. <laughs> but the idea of me praying to a saint, it's like, no, it's me and God. Or uh, me asking you to pray for me, some will allow that. But, but other beliefs kind of isolate me as a, as a me and God. Now, that's great. That's great. But, but Jesus tells us to love one another. And I, I find that is best done in a, in a faith community, right? We can, we can love each other that way. And, and cel the other thing is celebrating the Eucharist, celebrating the Mass, celebrating the sacraments. Those are, those are done uh, as a group, not just as an individual, me, I don't need organized religion. No, organized religion brings me incredible gifts. We have in our religion the sacraments, which are amazing gifts that God has given to us. And to say, I don't need that, again, God will allow us to make that choice, but we're leaving so much out there, so much things that can really help us on our journey. That's, that's the way I kind of look at that. <laughs> yes. Mark, I want to say, um, I, I heard that a lot, well, and also I've noticed it, because um, I, I went to Catholic school and we learned all the basics, but I don't think today, in even Catholic school, the kids are learning the, the faith. It, it is very difficult. This world, um, you know, the world is, is not the ultimate prize, right? Uh, the eternal life is the ultimate prize. And this world is really, really good at confusing and leading us down wrong paths, right? Uh, the, the world is, like the media, they're very good at rewriting history, telling you half-truths, trying to lead you and leaving out key pieces to get you to these ultimate truths. It's very difficult. So that's why we really need the people of faith to go out there and be these missionaries and help, help, help people through this. So the idea of this... Uh, uh, new evangelization. You've heard this terminology, right? And, and what is this? What's new about evangelization? What, 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 is, what is new about this? The interesting thing about, to me about the new evangelization is that what we are doing is we are now taking people who have heard the message and trying to get them the correct message, right? So originally, way back when, when the church was founded, I had evangelization going on. People had no idea anything about Christianity. Never heard about it. And so now I'm telling people, hey, let me tell you about Christianity. Let me tell you about this. Today, there's a lot of people who've heard about Christianity. The problem is that a lot of times the versions they've heard of Christianity are incorrect. Like I talked to some of my Protestant buddies, and we have some really fun dialogues, but this idea of faith and works, faith and works. And he's telling me, you Catholic people believe that you can work your way to heaven. No, we don't believe that. We do not believe that. So there's confusion, right? So we have a discussion about that. So in, in that case, there's people who really probably don't have as complete a story. Now how, do we, how do we solve that problem? Us. We solve that problem. It's never like, I need you to go do it, I you. That's, that's my job. That's my, it's our job to go try to solve that problem. Just one time I went to a, um, a uh, Mormon service for one of my friends who went off to, uh, to their mission for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of that, I stayed for one of their classes that they have there, just to see what's going on, as a part of um, like reconnaissance type of thing. <laughs> um, but what we're talking about was this concept that the family at home is the principal church. So what is it that the Mormons have that's in almost every family that is so different than Catholics? Well. The adults know their faith, and they teach 
that they do their business. And they pray together at home. They study scripture at home. They do all that stuff together at home. And it's something that I don't see with Catholic families because the Catholic adults don't know the faith. And so the kids don't know the faith because when they look at their parents, the models, they're at church and they're falling asleep or something like that. So I think there's a very shifting of responsibility to say, oh, the church will handle that. We'll send them to uh, catechism classes and stuff like that. But the first contact, the most learning happens at the home. And I think that's the main problem that we have. This, this is a so, fantastic point. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I'm an engineer and I like to do little experiments. And so uh, I'm a rock climber and um, I, so I go warm up, I go for a run before I go rock climbing. And so I decided one day as I'm, as I'm running around um, that I'm going to say hi to people. I just see what happens, right? I'm going to say hi. And most people have the white, the white wires coming out of their ears, right? And, right? I'm not, I'm not, how's it going? How's it going? Right? So as I'm running along, here come two guys dressed with ties on bicycles. Who am I talking about, right? Two Mormon guys, right? Let's see what happens. How's it going? Hi, sir. Good evening. I hope you're having a great day. I'm thinking, yes, this is fantastic. This is great. So, so you know, I love that. How cool would it be to see other Catholic dudes running around on their bikes and evangelizing and saying hi to a person's running? I mean, that'd be great. So one of the keys of this, this idea, this, our chart is gone, but um, what we need to do is capitalize on exactly what you're saying. How cool would it be? to bring these Mormon people into our church to make them a part of the big Catholic faith. We're missing these people. To, to come out and do exactly what you're saying. Help us to be better at teaching our, our families. Help us to develop community a little better. I'm not saying we don't do that as Catholics. That's not my point. But when Paul talks about you know, the various parts of the body, and you know the eye, and the, it can't be the ear, and the hand, and I, all the things he uses, we're missing key parts of the body, right? We're missing some of these beautiful Protestant people of different faiths that can help us. That can help expand the faith. That can help us learn. That can help us become more godly, right? We have the right. We have the right theologies here. But we would love to have more of these people in our church helping us do exactly what you're saying. Do it's great. I love that. One more, yes, sir. Um, so going back to the family thing of the Mormon, and what we were saying earlier, um, how do we incorporate that? Or what have you done to like? When you're having discussions with your Protestant friends, I feel like anytime I have a discussion with anyone Protestant, they're they spend so much time in apologetics. I really don't know how I don't have any answers to what they're saying because yes. I haven't built the yes the uh, yes I don't have the background. So so what did you do? I mean, I guess my question is, do we all have to go get philosophy and theology degrees? To okay, this is, I love this question. It's a great question. So so uh, part of the answer for me as an engineer is I started learning a little bit about apologetics. And there's some great tapes out there and CDs and stuff that you can get to start if you're interested in it. But, but I went to um, the Catholic Congress. That's the big event. Have you guys heard of this? There's like 50,000 or people or so that go to this. Uh, every year, they have speakers from all over the world to come in. They have it in Anaheim. Uh, I highly recommend going. It's once a year at uh, uh, like Memorial Day, I think it is. No. No. It's in March. Oh, it's a March. It's a March. I'm sorry. It's a March. So wait, the point of this is there's a speaker out there who's addressing kind of this topic. And he talked about uh, Saint, I'm going to screw up his name, I'll call him Prometheus the Great. I can't remember what, exactly what it is. But this is the guy in the early church. And he is uh, pulled into the army, and, and, and he's, uh, as, as people are, you don't volunteer, you get sucked in. And he goes on this journey, and they treat the, the army guys really badly. This will, this will get to your point. So what happens is uh, he gets off, and some people come up to him that he doesn't know, and they give him something to eat and they give him something to drink, and they take care of him, and they leave, okay? He gets back in the boat, he says, who are these people? Who are these people that would do this for me? Oh, they're Christians. Really? They don't, I don't owe them anything? Why do they do this for me? Why do they do this for me? And he goes on this journey, as he finally gets out of the army, and he says, you know what, I gotta find out who these people are. This lifestyle to me is incredibly compelling. These people are helping me, I owe them nothing, and they just helped me. So St. Prometheus goes on to be a great saint. He, he starts, he brings in all these, uh, these, these monks, like 7,000, into the church. Amazing evangelist. Who's the hero of the story? Well, we could say that St. Prometheus is, or we could say that simple group of Christians who met him and just did him a loving service and left. So the point of this is, do I have to know 
and hit people over the head with my Bible and all the great theology and catechesis I know. No. What does Mother Teresa do? She's incredible at, at converting people, right? What does she do? She serves the poor. She serves the poor, right? And just how I live my life, my daily life, do I live my Christian values? Do I love them? Do I, you know when my friend comes up and gives me lays out apologetics? Hey, I don't know. But I, I love my faith, and I believe it's true, and here's why. Great answer. But through how you live your life is actually an influence on people, a lot of times more of an influence than battling them with theology. So, so I would recommend continue living your Christian life. That's an incredible sign. Just like these people who gave Prometheus food and water, there's something compelling about that. You, you're doing something to these people, and you're helping them out, not through a lot of catechesis, which you can do, but just how you live your life is an amazing statement, an amazing draw for people into the Catholic faith. Are we, are we out of time? We're out of time. Thank you very much. I, I, thank you.